respected leaders, distinguished faculty, dedicated staff, award-winning graduate and undergraduate students, supporters, and friends. My name is Zhong Guoxia, a man with a burning desire to be helpful and very limited ability. <laughs> but extremely fortunate to be inspired, challenged, and mentored by a visionary, exceptionally ambitious, and hardest working provost on a daily basis. And to be surrounded by stars. When all the stars shine brightly, they also illuminate my part of the world. As your Vice Provost for Research and Strategic Initiatives and Dean of Graduate Studies, I welcome you to our seventh annual celebration and appreciation of research, innovation, scholarship, and creativity so that we can recognize some of the stars, share some of your outstanding accomplishments with others, thank you for your valuable contributions to our collective pursuit of an inspirational vision of UMass Boston as a distinguished public urban research university, and our shared commitment to ensuring access to excellence in higher education and keep you informed of some exciting new initiatives in the areas of research and graduate studies. As a comprehensive research university, we celebrate all forms of research, innovation, scholarship, and creativity. This event gave us a chance to get a little bit idea on what our outstanding colleagues in other disciplines do. However, instead of asking you to read a few of the 69 books published by our faculty, staff, and graduate students during the last 18 months or so, we have decided to show you something that can be best seen heard and felt with our heart and soul. When I went to college, I was told people working in social sciences and humanities are actually engineers of the human soul. We are very fortunate to have some exceptional creative talents on our faculty. Among them is Carrie Ann Queen. Assistant professor in the Department of Performing Arts, she earned her MFA in theater education, acting at Boston University, and BFA in acting from New York University. Has been a professional actor and director of theater, TV, and film for over 15 years, and previously taught at Boston University and Clemson University. We are very grateful that she joined UMass Boston, has agreed along with her creative colleagues and our talented students to tell us what happened in a very peculiar place, Urin Town a musical that she has directed. Without further ado, here is Professor Carrie Ann Queen. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Hello. Well, You're in Town the Musical had a very successful performance run this past weekend in the McCormick Theater breaking departmental records for packed houses for all five shows. 
<laughs> this was a semester's worth of research and rehearsal with 30 students, 22 on stage and eight in stage management and backstage, working together with faculty, using professional standards of excellence to create a, a university production produced by the Department of Performing Arts with additional support by the UMass Boston Alumni Association. It was also music directed by Todd Gordon, who is here with us today. Theater, yay. Theater is a true collaboration between director, a musical director, lighting, scenic, and costume designers, choreographers, and actors. The sets and lights have already been struck in the McCormick Theater, but what we have for you today is an encore of a couple of excerpts from the show. You're in Town is a satirical musical about a city in the not-so-distant future that has a water shortage so severe that all private bathrooms have been outlawed. Water is controlled by a private corporation which exploits the poor by charging them exorbitant fees for the privilege to pee. Outlaws are exiled to urine town, which we discover is really death. The first song is called Cop Song, which is from Act One, where a couple of dirty cops describe sending people to urine town. And then there'll be a scene and song from Act Two called Run, Freedom, Run, which is when the poor rebels kidnap the daughter of the corporate megalomaniac and decide to start a revolution. Thank you very much. Enjoy. I suppose I thought he'd be different somehow. Different? Old man strong? Always seemed a bit tougher than the rest. I was hoping he might, I don't know, surprise us somehow. If there's one thing I've learned in my years of enforcing the laws of this city, it's that the journey down to Urinetown offers no surprises. Not even from the very toughest among us. On that journey, expect only the expected. It's a hard, cold tumble of a journey, worthy of a gurney, a bumble down, a slapped face, smacked with a mace, certain to the base, and I stumble down. It's a path that leads you only one place, horrible to retrace, a crumble down, a hard, cold tumble of a journey, tumble of a journey to your in town. Julie Cassidy went to a field behind a tree, saw there was no one who could see her pee, but me. And Jacob Rosenblum thought he was safe up in his room. Didn't know the jars he kept up there would obligate a trip to a urine tomb. <laughs> <laughs> there are those who think our meth is vicious. Overly malicious. A bunch of fruits, but it's we who gather for the people. Tavern to the steeple. Lawful fruits. Our task, bring a little order. Swindle a lot of hoarder. From what he loots as a book. Says, certainly a season. Trample out of trees. With hotmail boots. Roger Roosevelt's kept a cup below his belt. Cup ran over when he knelt. He smelt. We dealt. And Joseph Old Man Strong held his pee for much too long. Hoped his son might bail him out. His guess was good, but also wrong. All up in a jungle, scooping up the bungle, nature's bowl. Life of conscious deprivation, certain aggravation took its toll. Soon learned power of the truncheon, organized a function, king to pawn. So if peace is what you're after, you're in town's the rafter to hang it on.
don't be like them, don't be like them, don't be like them, don't be like them, don't be like them. It's a hard, cold, tumble of a journey, a journey of a gurney, a bumble of that, a slap, a fix, a pump of a mix, a slap into the face as a stumble that, it's a tap, that leads you only one place, horrible to retrace, a crumble down, a hard, cold, tumble of a journey, jumble of a journey to your end town. A message like ours works best under extremely unbalanced circumstances. Such as we have right here. Exactly. Now get the rope. <laughs> That's it. String up <laughs> the answer. String up the serpent daughter of the criminal urinal odor class. <laughs> Bobby Strong. No one's going to be killing anyone around here. <laughs> why not? Because she's our security blanket. That's why. But Bobby, we're all so afraid, and killing her might make us feel powerful for a moment. Just, okay. Friends, I know you're afraid, but this has got to be about more than just revenge and the vicarious thrill of stringing someone up who can't defend herself. But why? We want to hang her as revenge for her father's crime. I think he's just in love with her. That's what I think. Maybe I am. What? And maybe I made a promise up there. I promised that from this day forward, no man would be denied his essential humanity due to the condition of his pocketbook. That no man in need would be ignored by another with the means to help him. Here and now, from this day forward, because of you, and you, and you, we will look into the faces of our fellow men and see not only a brother, but a sister as well. What does that even mean? When did he say that? I don't remember him saying that. All I remember him was saying, run, run for your lives, run! <laughs> Well, that was in the heat of battle, okay? And uh, in the heat, the actual hotness of battle, okay? The cry of freedom sounds something like, run, freedom, run, freedom, run away. My friend, you have to run, 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 freedom, run away. That freedom, son will shine someday. So then you better run, 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 freedom, run away. I'm frightened. Woo, as well you should be. Freedom is scary. It's a blast of cool wind that burns your face to wake you up. Literally? Yes. There's a trickle of sweat. There's a trickle of sweat. Dripping in your ears. Dripping in your ears. Still you gotta run.
I said freedom. I said freedom. I said freedom. Run. Away. Isn't that a fantastic? <laughs> Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Professor Quinn. Thank you very much the technical team, musicians, student staff, and all the performers. You make us, all of us, very proud. Also, I can feel much better about the UMass Boston under construction for the next few years. So, <laughs> thank you, Dean uh, Emily McDermott, for giving us uh, the wonderful idea on putting on such a great show. Thank you. Now it's my great honor to invite our inspirational, charismatic, devoted, and caring chancellor to the podium to give his remarks. Chancellor J. Keith Motley. <laughs> so how are you? <laughs> Let's give uh, those students another round of applause. So I woke up this morning and I was inspired to put on my violin tie. And I, I, I thought it was because I was feeling kind of um, depressed because my mother kept asking me, when was the last time I picked up my violin? And I didn't want to tell her how long ago it was. So I said, well, I picked up one this morning and I put it on. And I wore it, which isn't actually a tail because I did pick this up and put it on, not knowing I was going to come here today and just be so filled by your performance. You all were spectacular. Now, I've had an opportunity to see many of you perform before, and so I knew what we were in store for. I just didn't know it was going to happen at noontime on a day like today. Thank you for helping us all get through such a day with your inspirational performance and to the faculty, staff, and everyone else that had something to do with developing such a wonderful performance. Thank you so, so, so much. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm so grateful to see you. Um, I am so grateful that we are able to be together as a University of Massachusetts Boston to talk about our research today. While we exist here because of the generosity of the people of Massachusetts and our many other benefactors and supporters, our students succeed like those ones you just saw because of your vision, because of your dedication, because of your sacrifice, and abiding faith in public higher education. You, the faculty, and those who join you in all of your efforts in your pursuit of excellence, your pursuit of service through research, teaching, and innovation, scholarship, and creativity are why we are, as a university, moving closer to achieving our goal of becoming one of the premier student-centered urban public research universities, not just in this great city of Boston or this commonwealth, but in this nation and throughout the world. You are the urban architects. You are the builders. 
within our great society of endless change and renewal. Now last week, I had the distinct pleasure of hosting the public lecture, Common Threads, engaging our communities that featured the 2013 recipients of the Chancellor's Distinguished Teaching Award, Aradam Bandapapaya, and also who's of our Accounting and Finance Department, I'm affectionately known as Professor Bondo, but also the Chancellor's Distinguished Scholarship Award, Elizabeth Romer of Psychology, and our Chancellor's Distinguished Service Award, Paul Wantanabe of Political Science. Also last week, I had the great pleasure of joining Francis West, Worldwide Director of IBM's Human Ability and Accessibility Center, and one of our 2011 honorary degree recipients to announce a new collaborative innovation center in Cambridge. Now since the founding of our great university 50 years ago, access and inclusion have been at the heart of our mission and at the heart of our values. This new center is the result of a new partnership between IBM, the world leader in assistive technology, and the university's one-of-a-kind School for Global Inclusion and Social Development. The center will focus on expanding access to the benefits of technology through smarter policy, education, and also technological innovation. Now, creating an inclusive campus means that everyone who comes to our university will be able to access the high quality learning, teaching in this environment, and the research that are all part of our academic signature. We will also have the opportunity to use and customize new prototype technologies from IBM, which we're very excited about. I want to especially thank our Dean of the School for Global Inclusion and Social Development, William Kiernan, Vice Provost for Research and Dean of our Graduate School, Graduate Studies, Jean Guo Zha, and everyone else who was involved in helping to launch this new center, and for making this such a promising step toward full accessibility and inclusion on our campus and in all of our educational offerings. Now, later in today's program, Professor of Gerontology Jeffrey Burr is going to highlight the tremendous success of our faculty, students, and also our graduates in gerontology, one of the first such programs in the nation. Professor Burr will also share with us his vision for the future of gerontology at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. Now, recently I was at, and I noticed I just break up all your scripts, Provost Langley. So recently I was at Winston-Salem State University, and they took me to this place, and they said uh, the president, who also happens to be a friend, was telling me that they were the world leaders in gerontology, and that their center was the greatest in the world and all of that. So I got a chance to hang out with his faculty. And his faculty were so excited to see me because the books that they used were written and produced by the University of Massachusetts, Boston. So I threw my chest out as far as I could, and I rolled back up into the chancellor's office, who used to be my college professor. And for the first time in his life, I called him by his first name. I said, hey, Don. He looked at me strange, and I said, listen, man, you may think you're the best, but your faculty know where the best are. And that's not just a journey that I find when I go there. I'm sitting in China, the same thing happens. I sit up in Lowell, the same thing happens. I sit in Amherst, the same thing happens. I sit in the new mayor's office, and the same thing happens. That's why you're filling up his transition teams. So in addition to all those wonderful things the provost will talk about, I just thank you for allowing your chancellor with this voice 
in this attitude, to have more attitude, more confidence about his work because of everything you do every day. Thank you for that. So back to the script. In addition, <laughs> Dean of the School for Environment, Robin Hennigan, and Assistant Professor of Global Governance, Maria Ivanova, will share with you great news about their $3.1 million grant they received last September through the Integrative Graduate Education and Research Trainership Program funded by the National Science Foundation for a program called Coasts and Communities, Natural and Human Systems in Urbanizing Environments. Now this is exciting and it's interdisciplinary. It is all those things that I hear you all talking about that allows me to talk about it all over the place. This will span for years and it will unite fields of study and provide funding that will allow our doctoral candidates to address some of the world's most challenging environmental issues. So I am supposed to bring up our provost now, someone who is very strong about all of the issues related to this university and our research portfolio. But before I do that, I always slay our professor's name. And so I am going to publicly make sure that our professor, Aradam Bon Opataya, I'm getting better, that I say his name correctly and slow down enough to say it, because as Paul Wantanabe said at our event the other day, names are important. I've been called Motley, <laughs> Motley, and everything else. And so I know how that is, and I'll get better and better and better at that. But I do know how to say this, Provost Winston Langley. Come on up and say what you have to say, and thank you all. Not just for another lunch, but for another opportunity to see you to say thank you, and for another opportunity to have something to talk about and show off when we, then thank you to our dean for making sure that something like this happened. It was so inspirational for me. And now I can go and tell my mom I did have my violin on today. I did do something with it today. Yeah, she's all right. Thank you. It's thank all right. You. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chancellor. And, um, uh, good afternoon to everyone. I want to thank in particular uh, Jean Gaugier, the Vice Provost for Research and uh, Dean of Graduate Studies for this um, event today and for his work with us throughout the year. Uh, indeed, I always look forward to this engagement for the day, both as he described it as thanks and as a sort of reporting. Um, I'd like to read six lines uh, to you that is taken from the Mayas, their book of Genesis. And the days begun to walk and they, the, day, the days, made us. And thus we were born, children of the days, the discoverers, life searchers. I recite it's a, a, a poem coming from their understanding of the beginning of the, uh, the world because it says something about our being part of a dynamic universe, about our being part of continuing change. The chancellor's expression was endless change and renewal. And that in that change, change and renewal, we are from the very beginnings of time 
searchers and discoverers, all of us, because we seek to find ways of lending meaning to what we experience. Sometimes in the history of science or history of the modern period, we make references to the 16th and 17th century in the West. But whether we begin with the Mayas, whether we go to Chaldea, or Timbuktu, or whether we are in Greece, or whether we are in India or China, or any such sites of rather pronounced human inquiry, what we will find is that we try to develop frameworks for meaning, that we are searchers and discoverers. And it doesn't matter whether it came by way of religion or magic or trade or travel or what we within the university and our respective laboratories may define as particular modes of inquiry. All of us, according to the Maya, are born searchers and discoverers. And I hope that's how we think of our university. Because in its effort to establish its identity as the great research university to which Dr. Jia and Chancellor Motley just referred, what we must in fact create is that special culture the shaping of a collective attitude that specifically says that we are part of a living evolution. Evolution, not as something studied as a theory. It's an ongoing process in which we as searchers and discoverers have a special obligation to understand the nature of things, our place within those things as human beings, and to use that meaning for the benefit of that which we claim to represent, namely the public. And not to yield to those who think that somehow because they have temporary control of monies and technologies and land and buildings, etc., We must defer to them. All of what we possess that we call the built environment, including our buildings and our university buildings, are the offspring of our search and discovery, and if we make this site a special place for research and discovery, we do not have to differ to any. So welcome to this afternoon, and see this as one more step in our effort to elevate this search and discovery in ways that can proper capture what it is that, in fact, defines us, and to honor our ethical duties to the public at large. Thank you very much, Provost. Our next speaker, performer, and poet does not really need any introduction. He's an animated teacher, an accomplished scholar, a wonderful colleague, and one of the celebrities 
on our campus. He earned his PhD from Harvard University, taught at Harvard University and MIT before he discovered his true destiny at UMass Boston and fell deeply in love with this great institution. As they say, the rest is history. Now, I'm presenting to you the one and only Professor Duncan Nelson of English. Thank you. I'm all right. Is there a way to slide this a little further away? I'm... This Hulk? No? All right. I'll do it. So first I don my bardic bays. And you're in town proves just how free all of us are here at UMB. So we thank you again for that wonderful performance. My role as poet laureate after I put my glasses on. My role as poet laureate is once again to gloriate. These my colleagues who give their souls and their hearts to advancing the sciences and the arts. And first let me celebrate the renown won by Carol Quinn's Urinetown in which I found myself facing a student of mine, Rick Chasen. RIS, RISC, said aloud, comes out risk. And twould be folly should we miscalculate risks of risk aversion. Who else can rhyme risk and miscalculate? Hence we hail our school's recent immersion in a four-cornered collaboration between scholarship, research, and innovation, at the crossroads of which creativity bespeaks mankind's innate proclivity for coming up with ingenious ways of finding ways through this mind-boggling maze one that calls for ever more vigilant heed as our knowledge expands at warp speed. More and more input deciphered, decoded, wikied, and Googled, YouTubed, and downloaded. So let me first bestow a huzzah on our host and vice provost, Zhuang Guosha, <laughs> and hail the clear authorial Role of the sartorial splendor of Winston Langley, whose bow, ties, and Savile Row suits, as we know, are sexy X factors that enhance our chances of scoring substantial grants. <laughs> and here's to a man quick to bequeath his blessing on this enterprise, Keith. Motley, who both in vision and girth is the equal of any leader on earth. <laughs> the man. And now let's express our delight over seeing Maria Ivanova on the UN Advisory Board and hail also the 3.1 million award Robin Hannigan helped us win that will mightily serve the African environment. And then there's Ellen Douglas, who is presenting compelling evidence that we damn well ought to become aware we are gobbling up water at a truly alarming rate. And Spencer Descala has to date not only written many a book, but through role playing is able to hook his students into hearing and seeing each historical figure as a real human being. And unraveling the complexity of organizations is James D. intent on employing his position to our fully enjoying the human condition. And as for surveying art and science, we know upon whom to place our reliance for wiser and cleverer than owl or hedgehog or fox is Dr. Jack Fowler. 
That's pretty good rhyme, owl or and fowler, don't you think? And I could give many another example, for there are indeed candidates ample to whom I'd gladly ring an anth them. Robert Lublin, Rajini Srikanth, that's pretty good rhyme too, <laughs> whom many undergrads have the good luck of working with. Askold Melnichuk is out there giving help to the home lesson. Paul Atwood deserves a poem all to himself. And the environ meant as well, sir, by Bill Robinson. Nor must we forget the splendid sir, this to gerontology of Jeff Burr. So now at my close, I'll blow my bellows. That flame may illumine the names of those fellows elected to the Academy of Nursing. And also let there be like light shed upon the advancement of science on Sugu Sugumaran, on professors Rex, Corbin, Kaplan, and Shiras, Hagman and Hannigan, such an embarrassment of riches DeMarco and Rao, you may with reason wonder how I'll deal with Pool Hickey and Gross Dooley along with Stuart Shore, Fawcett and Cooley, likewise Lee Bawa and Eisencraft. But there, oh, I've left out, oh, but there, I've covered fore to aft the entire list. I know I left out too. Boot Tare, McAllister, and Okanya, how could I ever deal with that many? Fore and aft, an entire list, the whole bunch. So, feel free to continue on with your lunch. But before doing so, let's give one last brisk hail to the holy grail of risk. Here's the risk and all the rest of us, the rest of us. Thank you very much, Professor Duncan. It's always Nelson. It's uh, always a treat. Uh, I have actually just realized by scheduling you th in this part of the program, I have made my own presentation more boring than would it be otherwise. Uh, many people have found it a challenge to follow, uh, to speak after our chancellor. Now I have to follow you. Uh, you have provided the high, now it's my turn to offer the low, but as you know, if one only has the highs, it would probably not make it a moving symphony. In that spirit, I'm going to ask everybody to get into a multitasking mode, enjoy your lunch while we're going through the next segment of our program. As you may have noticed, at UMass Boston and Sodexo, we do chicken right. <laughs> we do too. So um, many thanks to Sodexo for the wonderful food and their superb services. Thank you. <laughs> this event it's a part of our effort in pursuing the inspirational vision of our founders. If you look at the menace of UMass, UMass Board of Trustees for their meeting on July 2nd, 1964, two weeks after the legislation to establish UMass Boston was signed by the governor. In the minutes, you find the following. The philosophy is to provide a quality in institution which eventually, like UCLA, may grow to 20,000 or 25,000 students Special emphasis may be placed upon urban studies and certain other programs that will lend uniqueness. In the statement of purpose for this institution, read by the first chancellor of this institution, John 
Ryan at his inauguration, he loudly declared, in providing young people equal equality of opportunity, we have an obligation to see that the opportunities we offer them are indeed equal to the best that the provide private schools have to offer. Otherwise, equality of opportunity means only that young people of limited means have equal access to something less than the best, and we perpetuate a class system of education. And that's the vision of our funders. With us today are also some award-winning undergraduate students. And this is a team led by Joseph Cohen, a doctoral student in computer science, a recipient of National Science Foundation Graduate Research Fellowship. It's a team of three graduate students and five undergraduate students. Four of them are first generation college students or graduate. This is a typical UMass Boston success story. If, <laughs> if you look at the teams that joined the competition, 2013 MIT Lincoln Lab Cybersecurity Competition, UMass Boston was the only public research university. Our team, led by Joseph Cohen, defeated 11 from MIT, two from Brandeis, two from BU, one each from RPI, NYU, Northeastern, WPI, Wellesley, and Dartmouth. They captured the second prize in the competition. Congratulations. I also want to mention it is a 48 hour street competition. They did not sleep for 48 hours. Thank you. With us today also some of the first members of the UMass Boston Undergraduate Research Scholars Academy. In spring 2013, the UMass Boston Committee for Undergraduate Research made three recommendations. One, to establish Office of Undergraduate Research. Two, to establish a Research Scholars Academy for our undergraduate students. Three, to convey a committee to explore embedding a research experience into the undergraduate curriculum across all disciplines. With us today uh, are Keith Reeds from the School for the Environment, James Lee and Luke Luyen um, in computer science, uh, Cheyenne Fox Tree McGraw and Frank Consolo from um, um, psychology. In the middle is a list of faculty members who have expressed an interest and commitment to provide sustained mentoring of undergraduate research. The Undergraduate Research Academy is designed for students who are interested in intensive research experience would like to go to graduate schools and possibly pursue a research career. So-called sustained mentoring would be a minimum of one year up to three years, four years until they'll go to graduate school. 
if you are interested and want to commit to this important initiative, and let us know. <clears throat> Many of our graduate students also received significant awards uh, during the last year. On the top, three recipients of the National Science Foundation Graduate Research Fellowships. As many of you know, this is an extremely competitive program. In our history, we received one before this batch of three recipients. Joseph Cohen in computer science, met, supervised by Professor Weidin, Amy Herbley in clinical psychology, supervised by Professor Alice Carter, Alan Stebbins in the School for the Environment, supervised by Professor Robin Hannigan. I'm very happy to tell you this year, for the current round of a competition, our graduate students submitted seven new proposals. Two from computer science, two from sociology, and three from psychology. I wish you all the best. In addition, Ed Edward Sands in the School for the Environment, supervised by Professor Crystal Schaff, received a three-year NASA uh, graduate fellowship this year. And J Jacob uh, Karyok in nursing, supervised by Professor Eileen Stuart Shaw, in fact, uh, he was notified uh, last, uh, last week. Uh, he's a recipient of a very competitive two-year pre-doctoral fellowship from the American Heart, American Heart Association. If you look at this number, 1.85% rank of 73 applications. Basically, your application was ranked number two among 73. Congratulations. <laughs> the tw our 2013 UMass Boston Chancellor's Distinguished Doctoral Dissertation Awards recipients include Angelique Eve Genito in computer si in environmental science supervised by Professor Eugene Gallagher. Sarah Lowe in clinical psychology, supervised by Professor Jean Rose. And Aba Sud in chemistry, supervised by Professor Mariana Torres. And two of our graduate students received a distinguished master's thesis awards. One is Hilary Hurst in psychology, and supervised by Professor A.B. Eisenhall. And also Angela Erb, a PhD student, current PhD student in the School for the Environment, also supervised by Professor Crystal Sheff. She received a distinguished thesis award from the University of Zurich. As you know, every year we bring a large number of new faculty members, the top-notch new faculty members, into UMass Boston. Here are just some examples for this year. After a couple of years, of extensive research, we have found the perfect person to be the Alton Branch endowed distinguished professor in science and mathematics 
and the director of the Center for Personalized Cancer Therapy, and that is Professor Jill Makaska. Joining us also include Professor Richard Fleming, Graduate Program Director in the Department of Exercise and Health Sciences, and Assistant Professor Elizabeth Sweet, coming from a Northwestern University. Two of them brought their R1, R01 grants to UMass Boston. Thank you. Also joining us, three National Academy members, including Rosanna DiMarco, Chair and Professor of Nursing, Dean Anahid Kowicki of the College of Nursing and Health Sciences, and Professor Skylar Corbin, our Vice Provost for International and Transnational Affairs. These are just some examples about uh, more than three dozens of first-rate uh, faculty members. For you, the newcomers, as well as others, I also want you to know you are joining a distinguished faculty at UMass Boston. I have selected a few uh, of our faculty members so you may uh, run into them on campus in the corridors. Among them, it's the elected fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, distinguished professor of biology, Professor Kamal Bawa. And I've been actually looking for this list for a long time. Finally, I compiled this list. Uh, right here shows eight elected fellows from UMass Boston uh, of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, including Kamal Bawa, Arthur Eisencroft, Robin Hannigan, retired professor Larry Kaplan in biology, Skylar Corbin, Michael Sharis, and Sugu, Manikam Sugumoran, and our latest elected fellow, Professor Michael Rax in biology. Congratulations. <laughs> right here shows eight elected fellows of the American Ac Academy of Nursing. They are part of the reason why our nursing program is the best nursing program in a public research university in the entire New England. One of the top three of all institutions, Yale University, Boston College, and UMass Boston. Rosanna DiMarco, Jacqueline Fawcett, Laura Heyman, Eileen Stewart Shore, Anahid Kowicki, and two, uh, one joint appointment, Mary Cooley, and uh, Patricia Ponte. And the newest elected fellow, Professor Hiyoka Lee. Congratulations. Also of note, two of the graduates from our PhD program in nursing was also elected fellows of the American Academy of Nursing. Both received their PhD from UMass Boston in 2010. Both are vice president, one, uh, one is at Boston Children's Hospital, one is at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. We also have Professor Margaret McAllister and 
T Professor Terry Butaro in uh, nursing. They are elected fellows of the American Academy of Nurse Practitioners. And the newest member in the Gerontological Society of America is our assistant professor of gerontology, Pamela Nadash. Congratulations. We also have two elected fellows of the American Physical Society. One is Professor Maxime Ochani, and one is Professor Gopal Rao. I, I pick the shorter name, Professor Gopal Rao. Thank you. I know there are others. So if your name is not included on this list, please kindly let us know. Gradually, we want to actually compile a complete list. As people around the world to mourn the loss of a giant and to pay tribute to Nelson Mandela. I also want to highlight the achievements of one of our distinguished professors. John Joseph Markley, distinguished professor of peace and reconciliation. Padraig O'Malley. He actually worked with Nelson Mandela to bring peace to Northern Ireland. He also worked with Nelson Mandela, carried $40,000 in his pocket, spent six months in Iraq, trying to bring people together to negotiate, and he recruited 36 senior members of the parliament and prominent tribal leaders that reflect the population of Iraq. He has monitored elections in South Africa, Mozambique, and the Philippines on behalf of the National Democratic Institute for International Affairs. Today, many of his colleagues are also broken peace resolving conflicts in Palestine, Nigeria, China, and other hot spots of the world. Wherever there is extreme danger and conflict, that's where they go. They came back safely. They also bring, they brought peace, long lasting peace, to many parts of the world. I want to thank Professor Patrick O'Malley and congratulate our McCormick Graduate School for all your accomplishments and thank you for your contributions. Thank you. <laughs> if you want to learn more about um, Patrick O'Malley, and they are actually a local filmmaker is making a documentary that will be called The Peacemaker. She, he is a true peacemaker. Have you seen this happy fellow in the corridor somewhere? It's Friedrich Troy Professor of English, Professor Lloyd Shores, recipient of the Pulitzer Prize for Criticism in 1994. <laughs> professor Peter Kiang, Professor of Curriculum and Instruction and Director of the Asian American Studies. I was really impressed by 
the collection of the prizes, awards that he received over the years. In 1986, he received the first annual Asian Constituents Award from the Boston Rainbow Coalition. In 1991, Massachusetts Teachers Association's Human and Civil Rights Award. He received the Distinguished Teaching Award in 2007, Distinguished Service Award in 2010. That same year, he also played a key role to make UMass Boston uh, Asian American, Native American, Pacific Islander serving institution. Worked with Professor Watlapi and Vice Provost John Becker and others to get a five-year, $2 million grant from the U U.S. Department of Education. This year, he received a Distinguished Scholar Award from the American Education, Education Research Association Special Interest Group for Research on the Education of Asian and Pacific Americans. Congratulations. You may have seen this at our website. It came out last Friday. If you look at this list, you will be very impressed by the impact of UMass Boston on our city as an urban servant institution. We practically run the city, if you look at this list. <laughs> Professor Paul Watlabi will serve as a co-chair of the transition for the mayor-elect Marty Walsh. Chancellor Motley and Cedric Woods, director of the Institute for New England Native American Studies, will serve on the Education Committee. Donna Haig Friedman, the director of the Center for Social Policy, and a senior research fellow, Tim Davis, will serve on his housing committee. And Professor of Latin American Iberian Studies, Race Cole Talicia, and, and Professor of Human Services, Miran Uriati, will serve on the Human Services Committee. Robert Dunford, facilitator at the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute, um, and former Boston police officer, will serve as a co-team leader of the Public Safety Committee. Director of our Labor Resource Center, Susan Moyer, will be serving on the Economic Development Committee. And Elish uh, Tabora, uh, Associate Director of the Talented and Gifted Latino Program, will be a co-team leader for the Youth Committee. Thank you all for very capably representing UMass Boston, having a significant impact on our city. Thank you. <laughs> Among the award recipients are Professor Karen Suyamoto. In May of this year, she was among 15 Asian American and Pacific Islander women invited to the White House to be honored as champions of change. Professor Sharon Horn in counseling and school psychology was one of 22 faculty members in the country to receive a $25,000 one-time cash award attached to Elizabeth Backman Award for inspiring their former students to make a significant contribution to society. And the award was presented 
in uh, fall 2012. Professor Jeffrey Keis Ke Kessler, um, professor of management science and information science, received 2013 publication award from Informs Decision Analysis Society for a book he co-edited with his collaborators. Professor Lee's Romer in clinical psychology in psychology was the recipient of the 2013 Chancellor's Award for Distinguished Scholarship. Congratulations. <laughs> we also have Professor Kristen Window, Assistant Professor of Curriculum and Instruction, receiving a very prestigious career award from National Science Foundation. The first such award was given to Professor Brian White in biology. If you look at the record, he received the award in year 2000. In 2008, he received the Chancellor's Award for Distinguished Teaching. In 2012, he received the Science Prize for Inquiry-Based Instruction from American Academy for the Advancement of Science. I'm also very happy to report this year, we actually, our faculty submitted seven career proposals. One from a CLA, one from a College of Education and Human Development, and five from a College of Science and Mathematics, the highest number of such proposals in our history. Thank you. These are two of uh, what I called a dream team at UMass Boston for STEM education. Under the capable leadership of our distinguished professor, director of Cosmic, Arthur Eisencraft, we have Chris, Professor Kristen Window. Professor Hannah Savian in chemistry, Professor Bob Chen in the School for the Environment, Professor Michael Gilbert, and Professor Lisa Consalvos, associated with Cosmic. In addition, we also have Baytech. Baytech was established in, 1990, in 2003 with a $3 million grant that stands for Broadland, let me see, uh, Boston Area uh, Advanced Technology Education Connection. They have been so successful in 2011, it was selected by National Science Foundation for another $5 million grant to replicate its success in San Francisco, Las Vegas, and Chicago. Congratulations. <laughs> More award recipients. Chancellor mentioned uh, Jack Fowler, the founder and former director of the Center for Cyber Research, received the most prestigious award in his field from the American Association for Public Opinion Research. Professor Zhongping Li in the School for the Environment. His publication in a very prestigious journal, Applied Optics, was selected as one of the most influential articles they published in their 50-year history. And that is cutting-edge 
research. Congratulations. One of our associate professors, a middle career faculty member in biology, Professor Alexei Veraska, received a very competitive R01 grant from NIH this year. If you do NIH-related research, you know when you get an R01 grant, you have made it. And right now, we have four R01 grants on our campus, two R00 grants uh, for junior faculty members. One is a Professor Sarah Hayes in psychology, and another is a Professor Jonathan Chelly in physics. We also have a P20 grant one U54 center grant and a significant collaborative grant with the UMass Medical School, P60. A few very significant uh, appointments. Uh, Chancellor mentioned uh, Professor, Assistant Professor Maria Ivanova was appointed by the UN Secretary General to serve on the board, a, a new board uh, created on global governance and uh, sustainability. There are only 26 people selected from uh, across the globe. One of them is a junior faculty member from UMass Boston. Professor Jeff Burr started serving as editor-in-chief of research on aging, a peer-reviewed bi-monthly journal published by Siege Publications. Congratulations. <laughs> that also make our gerontology with the two peer-reviewed journals. That shows scholarship and maturity of our program. In addition, Professor Jonathan Chu, uh, in history, was appointed as the chief reader of the College Board AP US History Development Committee. Congratulations. We also have four professors who received the Fulbright uh, fellowships, including Professor Pratush Bharati in uh, Management Information Science and uh, Systems, Professor Alan Douglas in the School for the Environment, and Professor Eve Sorum in English, and Professor Peter Taylor uh, received a fellowship uh, last academic year. And two of our students also received Fulbright fellowships uh, going to Bulgaria and Kenya. I want to actually select a few of our current students. We also have absolutely outstanding students uh, at UMass Boston. This is uh, Utam Babu Shrasta in biology, a doctoral student. Uh, for the last year, he received uh, two external grants. If you look at the list of publications, it is the past year, he had nine publications in refereed journals, one in science, one in nature. That's an incredible accomplishment. I got this information from your LinkedIn profile. If you didn't update your profile, I may have missed a few, all right? In any case, this is already super impressive. Congratulations. A 
Another outstanding graduate student is Karen Daniels in leadership in urban schools. He was a former principal in Boston and Brooklyn, superintendent in Chicago. He, she was appointed by Governor Patrick to serve on the Massachusetts Board of Elementary and Secondary Education. Look at what kind of students our programs attract. Congratulations. Another exceptional doctoral student is Hillary Bush in clinical psychology. Right here shows she was receiving a poster award from American Psychological Association Division 13 president. At the conference, she was also nominated to serve as one of only two student representatives on their board. Way to go, Hillary. <clears throat> you have many wonderful role models among the faculty in psychology. I also want to ask you to show you a few um, of our alumni. Mayor of Boston for 20 years, received his um, bachelor's degree in community planning at a UMass Boston in 1988. Um, Andrew Hardison is one of our first doctoral degree recipients in environmental science. He's now the head of the water and ocean governance programs of the UNDP. Anne Gross, graduate from nursing, is the vice president for adult nursing and clinical services at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. You know Gina McCarthy, the administrator of EPA, also graduate from UMass Boston. So did Dr. Bei Wu, a professor at Duke University, chair of the research committee of the Gerontological Society of America. And also, William Bratton, uh, a 1975 alumnus of Boston State College, served as a commissioner of New York, Boston, LA, now back to New York City again uh, in, the in his second round as a commissioner in January. And similarly, Paul Anastas, uh, father of green chemistry, received his bachelor's degree from UMass Boston, now a professor uh, at Yale University and assistant administrator of the National EPA. So this can go on and on. I also want to mention a couple of new initiatives. The Chancellor mentioned IBM. And uh, we also have the UMass Center for Health Equity Intervention Research, uh, led by uh, it's a partnership between medical school and UMass Boston. It came with $6.7 million. Uh, Maria Italy Torres uh, at the Gaston Institute and Philip uh, Granberry, Professor Laura Heyman, uh, Associate Vice Provost for Research, uh, and Cedric Woods are the investigators from UMass Boston. Thank you. <clears throat> In the area of uh, graduate studies, if you look at this, we have actually added a large number of doctoral program, new doctoral programs, about two or three or more every year. This is a collective effort involving GPD's faculty, college deans, and, and uh, the staff in the Office of Graduate Studies and uh, Graduate Admissions. I want to give a very special thank you to Jung Lim, 
special assistant to the provost in graduate education for her continuing leadership in developing new programs. Thank you. As a result of these new programs, we have seen some very encouraging trends. If you look at this, the total number of doctoral students uh, increased in double digits in the last two years. For many years, the number, total number of graduate students uh, was going down. And similarly, the ratio between graduate and undergraduate students. This semester, we're turning that around. We're going in the upward direction. And 3,911, that's a new record of the number of graduate students at UMass Boston. With the addition of a very enthusiastic, energetic, hard-working senior associate dean for graduate studies and graduate admissions, Steffi Hartwell. <laughs> and Michael Elderman, assistant dean for graduate marketing, recruitment, admissions, and retention. James Halloran, assistant dean, assistant director of financial management. Julie Sheen, the new office manager, and Jody Smith, Kelsey McCarley, a two capable administrative assistants. The better days of graduate studies are yet to come. Thank you. Uh, our chancellor mentioned about the IGERT award. I just want to mention, you know, there were 156 proposals, only 18 awards, very competitive. It is the first for UMass Boston, and UMass Boston is the second campus, UMass campus receiving such an award. This also brings us to a new model of financial support for our graduate students. If you look at this, Professor Crystal Schaff, one of the reasons she can attract the top-notch students, she has many external brands. And she's supporting one postdoc and six doctoral students uh, from his external grants. I also want to thank Dean Carolyn of the School for Global Inclusion and Social Development for setting a wonderful new model. At their steady state, they're going to have about 101 graduate students, 65 doctoral students, and 36 master's students. He has committed to provide financial support for all their full-time graduate students and the school will provide 85% of the cost, and university will only need to match the remaining 15%. Thank you. A couple of other collective accomplishments. One is uh, our psychology department, clinical psychology program, received the Beckman Presidential Cultural Award from the American Psychological Association, one of only three programs in the country receiving this award for the first time. And at the same meeting, uh, our professor, Alice Carter, also received um, an award for her outstanding leadership uh, in division 33, and this year, well, we're not only getting grants to support our graduate students, we're also creating another endowed chair, James Brad Chair in Disability Study and Workforce Development 
for the new school. Congratulations. And here shows, uh, we published 69 books, so I can only show the summary. If you look at this, uh, more than half, actually, were published by our faculty in the College of Liberal Arts. We know where the writers are. <laughs> and as the top department, English, published 11 books, and Sociology, six, and then uh, conflict resolution, human security, and global governance, and computer science, each with five books. Thank you. Congratulations. <laughs> In the area of external funding, um, we have set another new record at more than $57 million while the entire country going through economic recession, th slow recovery, through your collective efforts, we are maintaining our steady increase in the last four years. Congratulations. I think I'll stop right here. And we'll bring um, um, somebody who has led as a fundamental transformation of our Office of Research and sponsored the program, Matt Meyer, to the podium, who will give you some details of our external funding in FY13 and research development expenditure in FY2012. Thank you. Welcome everyone, and thank you for taking the time to join us in celebrating the wonderful accomplishments happening our, on our campus. It's my honor to be able to present the highlights of our FY13 external funding and our FY12 research and development expenditures. Uh, before digging into the numbers though, I want to take a moment to thank the staff of ORSP. Our team has come a long way, and we now have an amazing group of talented and diverse personalities. Uh, whether it's helping prepare a $10 million multi-year application to NIH or working with you on a final report to a small foundation, they're providing the support and direction you need. I can confidently state that our restructure is complete and we have a phenomenal team. ORSP staff, please stand up and be recognized. Today I'll be presenting to you the three key metrics we focus on relating to external funding. Submissions, the number of grants we submit to funding agencies. Awards, the annual value of the externally funded awards we receive. And three expenses, the amount of expenditures from all our awards. First, here are the amount of submissions to external sponsors over the past two years broken out by college and unit. In this budget climate, we need to keep aggressively increasing submissions to sustain growth. As you can see, FY13, which covers the period from July 1st, 2012 through June 30th, 2013, was a banner year. Most all units were well above FY12's numbers, and in whole, we submitted 418 applications, a whopping 25% over FY12. This is a great testament to the focus faculty and research staff have on external sources of funding. Here we move to the actual awards received. When we count awards on a yearly basis, we count the annual budget amount received in that fiscal year, not the value of all the awards. This slide shows the annual budget amounts from FY 1989 through FY 2013. With declining pay lines, sequestration, and overall Washington uncertainty, you would have expected a downturn as most institutions across the country have dealt with. Not at UMass Boston. All we did was have our fourth record-setting year in a row. We received $57.3 million in external awards, a 5.4% increase over FY12. 
The 57.3 million is broken out by college and unit in this slide, along with the percent each is of the total of FY13 awards and the percent change from FY12. As you can see, 22.4 million resides in the centers and institutes, which is 39% of our overall funding. The largest increases were seen in the College of Science and Math at 11.2 million, a 36% increase, and the College of Education and Human Development, receiving 4.4 million, a 39% increase. The top 10 awards for the year in terms of dollar value of their annual budget are listed here. Please join me in congratulating Dean Kiernan, Susan Foley, Stephen McGoldrick, Dean Grzowski, Jill McCoska, Deb Vauvert, Adon Colon Carmona, and all the project PIs on the U54, which is a collaborative center grant involving the contributions of many project PIs and units. Donaldo Macedo, Cecilia Gandolfo, Arthur Eisencraft, and Bob Chen for their amazing accomplishments. After receiving the award, the next important metric is expenses. This is the next slide uh, taken from an, an annual national survey conducted by the National Science Foundation called the Higher Education Research and Development Survey. For the period of FY12, the most recent data that was just released. This slide shows how we compare to other campuses in the UMass system and where we, where we rank nationally. The highlights are that our engineering, physical sciences, mathematical sciences, computer sciences, life sciences, and education categories all moved up in national rankings. For engineering, that number represents the contribution of one person, the director of the program, Greg Sun. Overall, UMass Boston increased three spots on the, na on the total non-science engineering category. We're now ranked 30th in the country and up six places in total R&D expenditures, putting, at, putting, putting us at 185th. There are four categories in which UMass Boston is ranked first in the UMass system. Education, social sciences, psychology, and all non-science and engineering fields in total. The next slide shows for each of those categories in which UMB was number one in the system, how they rank nationally, along with who is at number one in other New England institutions. Education is, in the, highest, is the highest ranked at number six in the country. Social science is 73rd. Psychology 70 in UMass, I'm sorry, in non-science and engineering fields in total at 30. So that concludes the financial portion of our program. FY13 was another great year. Thank you to all faculty and research staff for your leadership, as well as all the staff who helped support these important projects. Happy and safe holidays. Thank you very much, Matt. With the sincere apologies for uh, running uh, uh, over time, and now I want to invite uh, Professor Jeff Bird to the podium to give us uh, some highlights and share some secrets of their success. Uh, the crowd is getting thin. I appreciate all of you who stayed. I had a very brief presentation, and now it's going to be a very abbreviated brief presentation so that I know that you all need to get on to other things. Um, gerontology on this campus is actually has a, a big footprint. We have um, undergraduate programs, certificate programs, master's programs, PhD programs. We have Gerontology Institute, um, which has several centers and also houses the uh, Osher Lifelong Learning uh, Institute. There. All right, I just went through those things. These are, this is when this program started. Mission. Most of you may, many of you may not even know what gerontology is. It's the scientific study of aging through the lens of uh, social and behavioral sciences. Uh, a lot of people get gerontology confused with geriatrics, geriatrics being a more medically oriented approach to aging issues. All right, let's just talk about the PhD program very briefly. Um, we are the second oldest PhD program in the country, probably in the world. It's hard to tell, uh, data is hard to find. We're the only gerontology PhD program in the Northeastern United States. Uh, we produced more PhDs than any other program in the world, and our postdoc and employment outcomes are quite uh, impressive. Uh, we have students who have either taken postdocs or academic positions or general research positions at Yale University, Duke University, uh, Oregon State, University of Michigan, University of Minnesota, uh, University of Texas Medical School, and so forth. So, our graduates do very well when they leave here. 
Our current PhD students, by last count, which would have been last year when we were preparing our self-study for the ACLAUD review, uh, had produced 55 peer-reviewed articles, 61 technical reports, and they're very active, obviously, in pro uh, professional presentations. Our PhD alumni are unusually productive in my experience. They have, the this, this 60 plus graduates have over 900 peer reviewed journal articles, reports, book chapters, and books. Approximately 600 of those are in peer reviewed journal articles, along with 11, more than 1,100 professional presentations and $33 million in grants since leaving. Our full-time faculty have been uh, very productive as well. It's a very interdisciplinary group of eight professors, including folks uh, from sociology, demography, political science, um, human development, law, and urban planning. Um, as Zangao indicated earlier, we house two uh, peer-reviewed journals. Let me tell you a little bit about, very quickly, about our vision. After having come off a successful AQUAD uh, review, We've decided that we're going to focus uh, on health and aging even more than we have in the past. And in order to help us do that, uh, we're going to be hiring three new faculty members who have specializations in those areas. We're also uh, attempting to increase the internationalization of our uh, curriculum, our student body, and uh, research outputs. To make this work, we're involved in a, a number of strategies. One of them is a 4 plus 1 accelerated program strategy which uh, gerontology and the rest of MGH, uh, MGS, uh, under the guidance of our uh, dean, Ira Jackson, uh, is we're, we're putting proposals together to have four-year undergraduate, one-year master's programs in, in order to reach out to undergraduate students and um, provide sort of a value-added approach to, to getting two degrees at the same time. Um, we're involved in cross-unit doctoral program concentrations uh, with environmental, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, exercise and health sciences um, with the new Global Inclusion and Social Development School, and we're in conversation with the College of Management to do the same. We recently came back from a uh, meeting with um, the University of Massachusetts Medical School to determine if there were some uh, lines of collaboration and it was a very uh, fruitful visit. Um, we're reaching out to AARP in order to um, engage in some contract policy research with them, and we have a number of other things going on as well. All right, the, the sort of the mechanics of some of the things that we're involved in include streamlining and enhancing our relationships between our department and our institute. We're also pursuing a multi-dimensional strategy for funding PhD students. We're using as baseline the funding that we get from um, the provost's office, but we're combining that with grants and contracts, with uh, revenues from our Management of Aging Services Online program, from relationships that we have with other units on campus, um, and from a funding, uh, external funding strategy, fundraising strategy that we've just begun. Um, we've got a very sophisticated and complex uh, marketing and recruitment strategy that we're pursuing, and one of our staff people is headlining that. And again, I said we're designing and implementing this fundraising uh, exercise. And we are intending to increase our MAS program enrollments by 10% year in and year out, and in the PhD program as resources permit. Um, that's about as fast as I could do that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Burr. Um, now it's my great pleasure to uh, bring Professor Maria Amanova to the podium to give us uh, some details of the IGERT grant and how would it help UMass Boston become a global leader in sustainability. Thank you for all the diehards that are still here. Thank you, thank you. I, um, I'm here on behalf of founding dean of the School for the Environment, Robin Hannigan, and myself. Unfortunately, Robin fell ill today, so I will share with you the excitement that both of us and the 17 other faculty on campus who participated in this research proposal have for the integrative graduate research education and traineeship program 
that we received from the National Science Foundation. That was the, what the IGERT stands for. NSF gives these grants for all science. And I want to emphasize that because it is not an environmental grant, but our environmental grant succeeded in being one of the 18 awarded out of 156 that were, award, that, that were competing this year. But only seven of those, 80, of those 18 awards were actually for new grants. The others were renewed grants. Some of the other grants that received funding have fancy titles as neuroengineering from cells to systems, functional nanomaterials for sustainable energy solutions, computation-enabled design and manufacturing of high-performance materials. These are the other grants that were awarded. And ours, coasts and communities, the interaction between natural and human system in urbanizing environments is one of these grants. So Robin and I wanted to share with you, thank you. We wanted to share with you our, our excitement because this truly is a symbol and an indicator of the collaboration that is happening at UMass Boston, across disciplines, across departments, across geographies. There were 17 faculty that were part of this, uh, of this grant across four different schools and departments. The College of Science and Math, the School for the Environment, newly founded, the McCormick Graduate School of Policy and Global Studies, and the College of Management will all get two new PhD students for five years funded out of this $3.1 million grant. So the main purpose of this grant is truly to fund research and discovery about coasts and communities on our campus in collaboration with universities and institutions in the Horn of Africa. We partnered with the Horn of Africa Regional Environment Center, a institute within Addis Ababa University in Ethiopia, with several universities in, uh, in Kenya, including University of Nairobi, Pwani College, University of Edgerton, the University of Djibouti, and the United Nations Environment Program, the anchor institution for the global environment at the UN system. So the main thing that I want to leave you with in about this grant is that it's different. It challenges what academia has been about and what we think we have been about. Usually, we come to academia to answer the question of what is? What is the state of the world and why? What is the state of the environment? What is the state of the human pressure on the environment and why? In our classrooms, especially those in the policy sciences, we dare ask what ought to be? And that academia has shied away from that question. What should we have? What should governments, civil society, citizens, academia do about fill in the blank? A rising sea levels, about declining fisheries. What should we do about any of the global and local pro problems that we're facing? We are purposefully going to have our students answer that question. Not only what is and why, but what ought to be. But most importantly, we're going to push them even further. How do we get there? And that is a question that academia has shied away from for good reasons. We don't dare say to the world, how do we get from point A to point Z in a systematic way, lest, be, lest we be labeled as advocates. But NSF actually called for proposals that would have not only an understanding of what the problems are, but push students in the sciences and other disciplines 
to be problem solvers. And this is what we would aim to do in, in this grant. We'd push students to answer the questions what is and why, what ought to be, what should we be doing, and how do we get there? So this, in essence, is the core of our Coasts and Communities IGERT program. It is transdisciplinary because it unites disciplines in solving global environmental problems. It is transnational because it looks for solutions to problems that cross boundaries, that are in Massachusetts Bay and the Horn of Africa, but also around the world. And it is transformative because it will likely change the minds and the lives of the students that will be involved in grappling to solve what the literature calls wicked problems, like climate change, those that defy resolution and whose solutions will evolve over time. But what we will aim to do with this IGERT program is to push them to what we in the Boston vernacular call wicked awesome solutions. We're, Robin and I look forward to this journey and we invite you to join us. Thank you.